I'm Taylor. And I'm Tyler. This is Scripture Central's Come Follow Me Insights today, 1 Corinthians chapters 1 through 7. Now, if you look at the heading for this book, it says the first epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Corinthians. In reality, it's his second epistle or his second letter written to these Corinthian saints. If you look at chapter 5, verse 9, he references this initial letter that he sent to them. And then later on in this uh, letter here, you find out that they've written back to him. So this is the third correspondence, at least that we have record of, but we're missing those first two, even though they're referenced here. So there's been some water under the bridge, and the apparently the message he's gotten back is concerning some pretty significant struggles that they're facing in Corinth. So I think it's interesting to, to note the location of these Corinthian saints being just south of Ath- Athens, down on the Peloponnese of Greece. It's near the epicenter of Greek philosophy and Greek learning and the Greek language and basically the Greek way of life. And all the trade. If you look on a map, you can see that Corinth really controls all the trade routes east-west from a water standpoint and the north-south on land. And when you have that much interaction, usually you're going to have a lot of diversity in terms of lifestyle, religions, languages, and people. And this is one of the big issues that Paul is dealing with is how to help people be unified. Now, we saw this in the epistle to the Romans. Mm -hmm. How do you help people become unified in Jesus? The question is, Tyler, does this matter at all today? We don't exactly live in a unified world today. We don't live in in a world that breeds peace, peacemaking, and uh, forgiving. We live in a world that really seems to encourage more divisive speech and, and bickering and contending and fighting. So, especially in these first four chapters, look for the contrast between unity and division. And these Corinthian saints, are, they're struggling to the point where, watch how he, he opens this letter. He says, Paul called an apostle, remember the to be is added, so here's this apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother. So often Paul will seem to, even though Paul is literate and he can write, he seems to occasionally use scribes to help. So it seems that that's the case. Either Paul's writing or Sosthenes is with him as he's writing, and they're both composing this letter together. It's a little bit like Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery in the early Restoration time period. And so now, look at the audience. Under the Church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called saints, again, the to be is italicized, late edition, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. So that's his audience. He's speaking to saints. He's not speaking to general population in Corinth in the first century. And he introduces once again, as he does with almost every single epistle, the theology, the Godhead reference here. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he he comes down to verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Mm. You'll notice the definition of Zion is one heart, one mind dwelt in righteousness and there's no poor among them from Moses 7, 18. That, that is not happening here. He's asking them to come to be joined together and he uses the word in this context of same mind, same judgment. That's really hard to do in our current context. I don't know about you in, in church callings where you've served in a presidency or in a bishopric or in any kind of a, a a committee assignment where multiple people come together to solve a problem and they bring with them their perspective, their background, their goals, their vision. And sometimes don't, those don't always align and we don't always have the same mind and the same heart. That's why I love the definition in 
the restoration scripture of Zion being oneness because it's, in my mind, it's an easier thing to strive for unity and oneness than it is for perfect sameness because I'm, I may not have the exact same thoughts or feelings or, or goals as another person, but I can take differences in my opinion and my perspective and find unity in diversity with other people as long as we become unified or united in our common cause of building up the kingdom of God on the earth and increasing faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have uh, one of the slogans in the United States, a pluribus unum, from many, one. It's the same idea that organizations, societies, institutions typically fare better when people are unified. And on a more personal note, Tyler and I have been friends since 2011, and we have collaborated on lots of things, and we've talked about a lot of things. And when we show up at every time to talk together, do we always have the same exact idea? And what we have learned, both together in many other settings, is that when you take the time, when people are unified around a common goal of building the kingdom of God, usually you can talk through and find unity even though people bring different perspectives. And usually that's quite enlightening. And what an amazing thing in a, in a council in the church. Uh, President M. Russell Ballard has spoken frequently on, on counseling with our councils. And it's this idea of taking a group of people who come together, and this is what we're striving to find, which is the, the truth. And so you get different people come into that council and they may contribute different elements to the overall conversation. And you can see what happens if one person feels like they're the only ones who have the correct ideas. Some of their ideas are actually wrong. Some of them are right, but they're missing a lot. And it's beautiful when you can find all of this crossover and counsel with our councils and realize that if we will value that process, you can end up finding much of what the Lord would want us to, to discover or carry the kingdom forward in a much more effective way than if one group or a couple of people in isolation try to say, nope, mine is the only opinion that matters. So let's discuss a little bit of historical empathy here. The Corinthians, the saints in that community, this is their first time being Christian. As far as we know, none of them had grandparents that were followers of Christ. That should say something. So they're new at this. Imagine it's a brand new ward with people who are Jewish, Gentile, from different religious backgrounds, different languages, different uh, economic status, different levels of education. And here's Paul, who isn't currently in Corinth. He doesn't have modern technology of of cell phones and satellite TV, he has to write a letter. So imagine you're Paul, inspired of God, you're trying to help this young group of Christians find unity and understanding in the gospel. What do you do? And you might have to write multiple letters. If you've ever been uh, in a situation where people are in your charge, parents or your leader, have you ever had to repeat yourself to people? Paul has to do this, and he uses multiple examples of where the people had been uh, driven apart by disunity, and he teaches them how to come together. And we'll see this throughout 1 Corinthians. He sometimes uses the concept of a body, and eventually the idea is Jesus as a single body represents how we can be whole in our communities just like he is whole. So watch how he sets this up as Taylor was describing this. He begins in verse uh, 11 after talking about being perfectly joined together. Then he says, For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. So he's basically saying, I'm hearing that there's, there's bickering and fighting and contending going on among you. And then some say, Now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul. And another saying, I have Apollos, and I have Cephas, or Peter, and I have Christ. As if it matters who baptized them into the church. So, so Paul says, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. 
So he spent 18 months in Corinth during his second missionary journey, you'll remember back in Acts. So he's he's been there for a year and a half, he knows most of these people, and he's like, oh, I, I am so grateful that I only baptized Crispus and Gaius. And then you'll notice he says, lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. And then he remembers some additional ones, verse 16, oh, and I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. I, I was there a long time. I don't think I baptized others of you, but I think it's just that group. And I'm grateful that that's it, because I don't want you claiming that that I have more, more to do with your salvation or with your path of, of discipleship than what you might be claiming. It's kind of fun to see the train of thought. We often think of scriptures as just this, this monolithic block of truth that's just handed down from heaven. And you see this man dedicated to God, train of thought thinking through, how do I convince these people that you shouldn't start division by who baptized you? It doesn't matter who baptized you as long as it was done with the appropriate authority in the name of Jesus Christ. Which implies that the con part of their contention has to be somehow rooted in, well, my baptism is somehow more valid than yours because of Peter or Apollos or Paul who baptized. It's, it's an interesting scenario that Taylor already prepared us to think through is they don't have the, the ideal situation of generations of church membership. The, these are all members of the church for maybe a few years at the most, most of them, and all of that baggage of their culture and their history and their religious background coming to bear here. And quite frankly, there was a hierarchy in the pantheon of Roman pagan worship of if your patron saint or your patron god or goddess is seen as more powerful than somebody else's or in the Jewish Christian perspective there's this feeling of superiority that well I'm a good practicing Jew before I became a Christian so I'm a better Christian than you pagan who came in after so you can see the devil doesn't care what it is that divides, that divides us. us he just cares that we're divided and the Lord doesn't care what divides us. His whole mission is to unite us. His whole at one meant the process or product whereby we become one or unified, not just with God, but with each other. That's what our message is to the world today, to, to renounce war and proclaim peace wherever possible. So now you, you begin in verse 18 down through 25, a fascinating sequence in, in Paul's epistle here where he's describing something using kind of pejorative or negative terms to speak about what he and other missionaries and other apostles are doing, but it's not because he's saying it, it really is a negative thing, but because that's what everybody else is saying about them. Now watch how he sets this up. Verse 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. And then he quotes, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. So this is God who knows all saying, yeah, watch what I do. Uh, jump down to verse 21, for after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. He's speaking to people in Corinth who were, again, near the epicenter of, of Greek, Greek philosophy and Greek learning, and the Greeks are all about gnosis or knowledge and gaining intellectual prowess, wisdom. learning, wisdom. It seems that there are members of the community who've been infected is probably not the right word, but feeling the sense of pride and superiority that their learning is makes them better than other members of the Christian community. And we don't know exactly what the learning is, but they have defined themselves as wise. And here it's interesting that Paul is trying to point out there's really only one wise person. And Paul then tries to point out how the how the missionaries are the foolish of all, which makes them the wisest. So there's kind of this irony. He's trying to bring down the wise that if you are wise in your own eyes, you will probably miss the real wisdom, which comes from God. Such a, a powerful uh, rhetorical technique he's using here. So again, verse 21, for after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. In all their learning, they didn't come to know God. 
it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Let's try something really foolish. Let's go out and preach. For the Jews require a sign, but the Greeks, or and the Greeks, seek after wisdom. So the Jews want this evidence, this sign, and you see it going clear back to Sinai and clear back to Egypt, the ten plagues. To get Pharaoh convinced, they come out and for 40 years out in the wilderness, what are they getting? Sign after sign after sign that God is guiding them through Moses, and then later on through Joshua, and later on multiple signs through the judges and signs through the kings. They've been kind of pre-programmed to expect that. And But even back then, it didn't always work, and still here, they're still struggling. We're waiting for a sign. It's like, you had a sign. You, you've had it's your sign. It's called Jesus. In verse 23, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. Look at this. We're preaching that our God that we worship, who is our, our Savior and our Redeemer, who's going to, to exalt us someday, that he was crucified on a cross. Notice the qualifier here. To the Jews, it's a stumbling block. The Greek word there for stumbling block is scandalon. It's a scandal. You don't need a translation in English to know what a scandal is. A scandalon, it's actually a trigger to a trap. If, if you picture uh, like a mouse trap, it would be that little plate that you put the, the peanut butter or the cheese on that triggers the whole trap. So to the Jews, they're saying, no, that is a trap. Do not listen to this. These, these are apostate Jews from the leadership of the Jewish perspective. They see the, the preaching of Christ crucified and then resurrected as this scandal on. Why? There are a variety of possible answers to that, but one of them could be Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 23. If you go back to their law, they have this very clear tradition. If a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be to be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day, for he that is hanged is accursed of God, that thy land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. So you can see how this, uh, if, if you look at your footnote there, 23a, it says, according to rabbinical commentaries, to live, leave a body hanging was a, or a degradation of the human body and therefore an affront to God in whose image man's body was made. So you can start to see they're saying, cursed of God is he who hangeth from a tree. And you're telling us that your God was hanged from a tree. It's, it's a scandal on, it's a trap and it's going to destroy you from their perspective. Now, what about the Greeks? The, these Gentiles, they're saying unto the Greeks, that's just foolishness. Your God died on a cross? And was resurrected? Like, where's the rationality in that? Where's the evidence? Where's the logic? So, Paul is putting himself at the epicenter of two major intellectual traditions, Judaism and call it pagan wisdom thinking, and Christianity violates the expectations of both. Which you have to add to this, the Greeks, not just their unbelief in resurrection because of the Greek philosophies, but it's their idea that your God could actually suffer, bleed, die. There is no God in the pantheon of the Greco-Roman uh, pagan uh, world that, that is going to die like this. And crucifixion, all of these Greeks are fully aware that Romans will save that death, not for Roman citizens, but for the lowliest and the, the worst of the world. criminals, the worst of the worst, those are the ones that get that cruel form of death. So for them, it's absolute, utter foolishness. How could you believe this? On any level, it makes no sense to them because it just doesn't line up with their knowledge, their quote-unquote wisdom. 
Now watch what Paul does with that. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Um, Joseph Smith changed the called in verse 24 to say, but unto them who believe, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. This is the wisdom of God to those that believe, whether you come from the Jewish or the Greek background. It's a, it's a beautiful clarification that Joseph Smith made there. Which brings unity. Now remember, he's trying to solve the problem of disunity and what immediately is a solution. Jesus, his death and resurrection, it is the ultimate wisdom. Yeah, so if you, if you see this, he's saying, can you see the irony? That his wording here, this is the wisdom of God. This is where we find life. It's actually in the suffering and the death, not a sacrifice of a man or a beast, but the sacrifice of a God and the resurrection of a God, that this is God's power manifest. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. And isn't it fascinating that in his very own words, Jesus Christ speaking to the Nephite Lamanite disciples in 3rd Nephi 27, when he comes down again, because they've been wondering, what are we supposed to call the name of this church? And he appears to them, and after teaching them the name of the church, being called after him and built upon his gospel, he then goes into that section there where he describes in verse 13, 14, and 15 of Second Nephi, or of 3rd Nephi 27, this is the gospel which I have given unto you. This is my gospel, and he describes it, and the very first thing he mentions is that he was sent into the world by the Father to be lifted up by men and to be slain for the sins of the world, to be crucified. So that? So that he could bring all of us up to be judged according to our works. Ironically, he was already judged according to our works and found guilty and killed, which once again is a scandalous statement to the Jews and it's foolishness to many of the Greco-Romans, other than those that obviously believe. This is really helpful, Tyler, because I don't know about you guys, but sometimes when I read the scriptures, it's entering into a bit of a foreign country. The gospel is not foreign, but how Paul is trying to position truth and help people understand sometimes sounds different to our ears because we don't live in those ancient circumstances, even though in our day we have enough disunity to fill a lifetime. Now watch verse 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And then go down to verse 27. God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. This is so interesting because, as you were pointing out before, the Greco-Roman society is very stratified, very hierarchical. People know their place. And Paul is actually discombobulating those expectations. He's inverting everything. We hear this phrase, the first shall be last, the last shall be first. He's essentially preaching that message that your expectations for how the world is ordered is different than how God himself orders reality. So if, you, if you're in a position where you're struggling to understand certain things in the gospel or certain teachings or doctrines or even practices in the church, um, chapter 2 is a really powerful place to start because he tells these Corinthian saints that when he came to them, he didn't come with excellency of speech or of wisdom to declare the testimony of God. He says, I only declared unto you Jesus Christ and him crucified. Verse 3, and I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. Interesting, because if you remember in his second missionary journey, right before coming to Corinth, like right before, he was in Athens. And what did he do in Athens? He quoted their poets. 
that they are the offspring of God, and it didn't go so well. He used their writings to try to teach the principles of the gospel, and it didn't fly. And so, when he got to Corinth, he's telling them, look, I, I did not use in my speech man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Brothers and sisters, you're going to notice throughout the scriptures that when a group of people or an individual, not just in the scriptures, but in real life as well, when people become convinced using methodology of the world, sources and resources of the world, when you convince somebody that the church is true or that the gospel is true or that the Book of Mormon is true or that the church is whatever, it's just a matter of time before they get unconvinced, usually. Deep conversion is rooted in preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ where the Holy Ghost can carry that message deep into the soul. It's not the convincing using the learning of the world. And to add to that, it's God definitely uses wisdom and intellect, but as Tyler is saying, we can't simply rely on that alone. We have this idea by study, that's the mind, and by faith, which is the heart. And technically, the heart actually doesn't do any thinking. Everything actually happens here in the mind, although the soul is part of the totality of your body, and you can feel that spirit witnessing when you are encountering and living truth. So look at verse 14, um, skipping clear down towards the end of chapter 2. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto, the, unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. If we're not careful, we'll take that verse that Taylor just quoted by study and also by study. <laughs> We won't, we won't be able to get to the by faith. We will take, I will tell you in your mind and in your heart and say, no, I don't want to know in my heart. I'm going to deny the spirit. Second Nephi 28 talks a lot about this, about denying the power of the Holy Ghost and relying on the intellect and on the strength of my arm. It's on, it's on my money, my possessions, and my knowledge that I put all of my hope and my trust in the future. And he's saying, it, these things are not going to be uh, discerned by the natural man. It's only the things of the Spirit are going to discern the things of the Spirit. We have to make place in our soul, in our heart, to feel and to, to be meek enough and humble enough to allow the Holy Ghost to teach both our mind and our heart. Which now brings us to chapter 3, and he says, uh, Verse 2, I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. Did you notice this little indicator here that Paul's acknowledging to the Corinthian saints, I'm not giving you the way to your matters of the kingdom here. I can't serve you meat because it's going to choke you. You're, gonna, you're not going to be able to swallow it and digest it. So I'm giving you milk. And what is the milk he's giving them in the beginning part of 1 Corinthians? It's unity in Christ. It's until you get that, I can't talk to you about things of, of more eternal uh, import and things that your mind, your intellect are just itching to learn about. I, I'm not going to go there because we're struggling with the basics of the gospel at this point in Corinth. This is an interesting pattern and rubric. I sometimes ask myself, when I feel like I don't want to deal with the basics of the gospel, am I really being aligned around God's truth and his purposes? If I feel like I want something that's mysterious or out there or esoteric, but I can't deal with unity, I'm missing something. And so I have to ask myself, am I really fundamentally focused on what matters most, which is unity with my neighbors? because we're all aligned to God. And once we do that, sure, God's going to reveal other things, but if I ever find myself distracted by something like, oh, I wonder about that, I always have to ask myself, where is my heart? And for me, the, the litmus test here is, what are God's prophets and apostles and, and appointed leaders talking about currently? I'm not talking about 20 years ago or 50 years ago or 150 years ago. What are they emphasizing today as a pretty good idea of what I should be focusing on 
individually and collectively with my family to say, okay, these are kind of the, the benefits of having a prophet on the earth today, but am I actually listening to him or am I tuning my ear only to uh, writings from the past? So you come now to chapter three and verse uh, nine, he says, for we are labors together with God. Ye are God's husbandry and ye are God's building. Now, the we in there is Apollos, and by default, Cephas or Peter, and all of the apostles. We're all working together. I don't care who does the harvesting. I don't care who does the planting or who does the watering, because we're not going to get up to heaven and say, look at what I accomplished. We're going to get up to heaven and love the Lord God with all of our heart, might, mind, and strength, and love our neighbors, ourselves, and be grateful that we got to to have these relationships together. We're not, we're not making sacrifices at the altar and then standing around waiting for a receipt, like Elder Maxwell mentioned on one occasion. We, we're just grateful to be able to serve in whatever calling, whatever capacity the Lord calls us, and give him the glory because he is the perfect pattern of this. Anytime anyone gives glory to the Savior Jesus Christ, what does he do? He doesn't say, thank you, I deserve that. He never takes it. He always reflects it to God the Father and gives him the glory. What a beautiful pattern. I love how Paul in the next couple of verses reminds people that our works and deeds here will always be burned away. Just like any material thing could eventually be burned and you have to rebuild a house. The only thing that really matters that needs to be burned is the Holy Spirit burning God's truth and love in our soul. And this gets him into talking about this temple that we have that needs to have the burning of fire of God's love in our soul, in the temple of our body. Such a powerful analogy, actually, that many of you have, have quoted this, or, or this will sound very familiar to most of you. Chapter 3, verse 16, he says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Now, a, a little fun fact here. The word ye, the preposition ye, is actually the plural form of you in the Greek. So he's talking to the body of saints in Corinth. Didn't you know that you, all of you collectively, you are the temple or the nous of God, this holy place? Uh, back in Jerusalem in the big, huge Hiron style of Greek temple, the nous is the building with the holy place and the holy of holies in it, where the presence of God dwells inside of the holy of holies. And he just said to these Corinthian saints, didn't you know? You, collectively, you're the nous, you're the, the holy place and the holy of holy place where the Spirit of the Lord can come and dwell in you. And if one of you creates disunity, if the temple loses its ceiling or wall, it's kind of still a temple, but it's a bit of an issue. And it's actually hard to maintain the sanctity of a temple if you're, lose, if you're missing half the building. So we often do look at this about our own temples, which is true. Our bodies are temples, but we also have the collective body of the community. And you think about the, sp the Spirit of God like a fire is burning. That was sung at the temple dedication of the Kirtland Temple. If we want to have more of God's Spirit burning in our collective souls, we need to be unified. So, lest some of you get really disappointed and think, ah, oh, but I love the object lesson of my, my body being the temple, as Taylor's describing here, don't lose heart, because Paul is going to bring that up in chapter 6, verse 19, speaking of you individually and your body individually. So, you get both here the collective, the, the congregation of saints, as well as the individual, both being these symbolic temples for the Spirit of God to come and dwell. And he says, verse 18, let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. We, we've touched on this before. It, it's not that learning and gaining in knowledge and intelligence and in wisdom is a bad thing. The Book of Mormon clarifies this beautifully. To be learned 
is good if there's that two letter significant word if they hearken unto the counsels of God. The problem becomes when our learning and our quote unquote wisdom puffs us up into a pride to the degree where we feel like we're smarter than God and we're smarter than his prophets. And we we need to correct his prophets or correct people who aren't as wise as us in our own eyes. That's the problem. I had this experience many years ago when I was at graduate school. One of the graduate schools I was at had half a million books published in the library about the Bible. I once calculated that it would take me like 20 years, I can't remember if that was the number, just to read the titles of all those books. So in school, I read a lot of this stuff. And I remember walking across campus one day, just this crush of overwhelming feeling that ever learning and never coming to the knowledge of the truth. Now, I appreciated learning about the ancient culture and history of the Bible and the Bible writers and the Bible people, things that we share with you here. But I started thinking about my grandfather, David Ballstead. He was, in, he was born in Germany, immigrated to the United States around 1910. He never had much of a chance of formal education. Um, if I recall what my mom said, he wanted to be a doctor, never had the opportunity. And he served faithfully throughout his life in many different capacities. And I saw him as somebody, and his wife too, my grandmother Helen, as deeply faithful people, good people who love their neighbor and love God. And I often thought to myself, I, I would call this for me the David Balstead test. I would study all these things and I'd say, that's interesting and it might give me some insight to scriptures, but do I need that to be saved? Would my grandfather, David Balstead, need that to get into the Suster Kingdom. And the point here is that get all the learning you can. We learn in the gospel to be, to be a member of the God's kingdom is to embrace all truth. And this has been a good reminder for me that I cannot get too wise in my own eyes. I can be very grateful for the enormous work that biblical scholars and others have done to bring truth and light to the world, but not let that distract from the fundamental and most important truths. Me knowing footnotes about Greek doesn't mean I love my neighbor any better. But Hopefully, it would inspire me to do so. Absolutely. So look at some of these little phrases that come starting in verse 19 down through 23. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. Verse 20, and again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. What's the significance of vain? It's this deceptive, fruitless. They're so turned inward that it's not going to produce anything other than more pride. Look at verse 21, therefore let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours, and ye are Christ's, and Christ is God's. There's a beautiful chain of, of relationship that Paul just set up right there at the end of chapter 3 for us to consider. In other words, if my learning isn't serving to one way or another connect me more with Christ, and we're not just talking spiritual learning, we're talking all of the secular truths that you can get your, your hands on out in the world and to learn, eventually all of those things should help us to be able to come more fully unto Christ, and by default Christ will bring us to God the Father, who knows all all things, and all things are present unto him. Our, our religion embraces all truth, Joseph Smith has said. We don't care where we get it. We're going to embrace it. If it's true, we want to know it so that we can apply it because it makes us more free. Know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And that truth is meant to serve people, not to be used to beat them with and hurt them with or say, look, I'm better than you because I happen to know a little bit more than you about this. Now, God doesn't have a problem if you happen to know more than other people. The point is, use every tool God has given you to give it away, to serve other people, to uplift them, that they might receive as abundantly as you have. So now we get to chapter 4, where the Lord is asking for those who serve with him and under his direction to serve with this absolutely faithful perspective, and to not be upset when things might go wrong, or when not everybody loves you, 
or when you might even get persecuted in the process. Or stoned, as Paul had as been. As Paul had been. Um, notice he then shifts gears here in verse 7. He says, For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? He's saying, everything you have has been given to you. And some are like, no, 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 no. I deserve it. I earned it. I I got a job. I learned. I prepared my mind and my hands and my ability to be able to get that job. And I went and I worked really hard and I got that paycheck and I bought all these things. Look what I have done. I merited it on my own. And can you picture the angels up in heaven saying, my, 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 you think you did all of that independent of God. All of that capacity to think, to read, to learn, to study, to grow in your intellect, you did that without any help from God, huh? And you got all of these opportunities without any divine help, and you had the energy and the breath in your nostrils even, to go and and perform this work. You did all of that without any help from the Lord, huh? His point being, nothing that I have is really something that I did without any divine grace or any divine help along the way. This is an important point, Tyler, because in the modern Western world, we have a couple of concepts of the idea of merit. Now, we don't want to say that people don't demonstrate merit. Clearly, people do. But sometimes, if we push this too far, the claim is that I have merited this all off my own genius alone. And I think we could multiply examples, which we won't do here, of people who have claimed the success they received was all of their own doing. I merit this. I deserve this. I've also heard people say, uh, I am a self-made man or I'm a self-made woman. Well, I love the fact that somebody worked and they took the opportunities and they magnified their lives. They grew themselves, but with the help of God. So the idea here is we are on this earth to be agents unto ourselves. We are intended to grow to be like God, but everything, every ounce of growth we receive is not just because of us. It's ultimately because of God, and we should always remember that humility. And here's Paul, one of the greatest Christian missionaries of all time, really one of the greatest speakers and writers of all time. And look at the humility where he continuously acknowledges that all these gifts that he received are really things that God gave him that he could then use to bless and uplift others. It wasn't meant to aggrandize himself. And and not just that, that he's lifting and building others, but he's saying, look, we look at verse 9. I think that God has set forth us, the apostles, last, as it were appointed to death, for we were made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. He's saying, look, we are not in this to build our name or to build our kingdom. We're in this for the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is the only purpose moving forward. Wouldn't you say our modern day leaders, both up at the higher level and many local leaders would be described by this. Absolutely. In fact, look at his his plea in verse 16. Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me. <laughs> the, the Greek word there for followers, you might not need a, a huge help in the English translation here. The Greek word is mimetes, mimetes, mime. What does a mime do? It copies what it sees. It mimics. It mimics. Mm -hmm. He's saying, I want you to follow me. Why? Not because he wants followers, but because he knows who he's following. And if you'll follow him as an apostle of the Lord, he knows what path he's on and he knows where it's going to lead. I love that when we think of that phrase, follow the prophet, follow the prophet. Think through the, the Greek lens of what it might mean to mimetes the prophet, mimic them. Look look to the prophets for an example. Unfortunately, we have a world that is inviting us to uh, mimetes the the, uh, influencers of the world from 
a myriad of different perspectives. They're all calling us different directions. That's why it's so powerful to me that God has given us prophets, seers, and revelators. So let's finish off chapter 4 with verse 20 and 21. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. That's an interesting thing to say in a letter written with words. Mm, I hadn't thought about to that. To the Corinthian saints saying, look, the kingdom of God is not in word, but it's in power. Where do you get power? It's when you can take words of scripture and words from the prophets, both ancient and modern, and you can translate them into appropriate uses of agency, that's where you gain the power to, to act, where you get more agency, more freedom, and more knowledge because you've learned from your experiences how to become more like the Savior. So in chapter 5, Paul moves to a difficult topic about one of the members of the church having committed adultery, and this was causing disunity in the community. Remember, one of the key parts of Corinthians is how to have a unified community. So in the ancient world, well actually in our day to day, generally people see a difference between what we might say is the body and the spirit, that those are clearly distinct entities. The ancient world didn't see those as different, but actually on a trajectory, that there are different variations of the same element, if you will. And Paul's influenced by this worldview. They didn't have the modern scientific perspective that has evolved since the 16, 17, 1800s, particularly in the West. And so he's talking about when somebody does a sin with their body, it's a form of disease that ends up impacting the spirit. And also, if you have a diseased spirit, you might see that impact in your body. Now, sometimes you see in the Old Testament, New Testament, people have disease and people say, well, they must have committed sin. That's the worldview, that if your spirit is cankered, your body will represent that. Or if you, again, commit sin in the body, it impacts the spirit. Remember, we talked about the community is a body. You have a body. If you're part of this temple and you commit disease or sin with your body and you come into the community, you're going to then disease the community if you don't repent. That was the way they, they saw it. Now, we see it a little bit differently. We want people to come to church. We all show up sinful on Sunday, and we want to partake of the sacrament. Paul was trying to deal with the fact that he didn't want people who were purposely and in a non-repentant way showing up to church and possibly infecting the unity of the whole. Now, if we had Paul here today, he wouldn't say, hate the sinner and kick him out of church. That's not really his message. It was appropriately help people who have sinned to repent. And if they refuse, there are steps for how they should not be part of the community for a time until they're willing to be whole and not bring disease into the community. It's very helpful. Now we come to chapter 6, and he gives this, this rebuke to the Corinthian saints because you had among some of these contentions, such a, a sharp disputation that they decided to sue. And they would take their case before the earthly tribunals to be judged of, of the Gentile courts there in Corinth. And he's telling them, this is, this is to your shame. You should not do this. You should judge between the brethren. You shouldn't go outside of the church for these judgments. Doesn't Jesus teach in the Sermon on the Mount? agree quickly with thy adversary. thy adversary while in the way. And it turns out how often could problems get resolved if people just kind of calmed down and said, what really matters in this life and where are we having a difference and can we find a way to be unified? And it turns out my experience has been most people who are centered on what matters and are willing to respect one another can find a way to resolve things through good, loving communication. So, this chapter has some really beautiful little gems in it. Look at verse 11. And such were some of you, the such being this list in verse 9 and 10 of all of the different kinds of, of sins that can be committed. He says, and such were some of you, but ye are washed. Paul's saying, I know your backgrounds. I know what many of you have done, but you're washed. You're clean. You're sanctified but you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. 
it's almost this invitation to say, guess what? You're, you're fighting each other because you're, you're trying to hold each other hostage to past doings. Well, guess what? You have all done bad things in your past and now you're clean. Christ was merciful to you. Can you extend that mercy to each other? Can you stop being so exacting and so judgmental that you're going to choose to take each other to court over this? And then he goes down to verse 15. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. Adultery was rampant in Corinth. Up on the hill, Acro Corinth, where they have a temple up there, a pagan temple, it is centered around adultery. And many of those saints must have been struggling with that particular temptation, and Paul's aware of it. He's saying you can't do this with the body of Christ. Because it's going to bring disease into the whole community. you got to keep yourself clean. And then he says down in verse 19, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. That verse 19 is so profound when people say, look, it's my life, don't tell me what to do. Here's Paul saying, um, actually, let's qualify that statement a little bit. You are not your own. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And verse 20 says, ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And can I just say, using this analogy of body to spirit and this, this warring faction kind of contention inside of us between our body and our spirit, often we, we portray that body as, as just evil, as bad, and the spirit is good without remembering that Lucifer and all of the hosts of hell were up in heaven without a physical body, and they committed sin so serious that they are now condemned to outer darkness forever. Apparently, you don't need a body to commit extremely serious sins. So maybe we would do well to not put the body and the spirit in, in competition or contrast each other, but figure out how to find unity between this incredible gift of our body and our spirit to glorify God in all that we learn, all that we do, all that we say, all that we desire. What a beautiful gift the Lord has given us. And as we get to chapter 7, Paul continues his theme about what we might call chastity. And he gives lots of instructions, uh, small case examples of how um, uh, a wife and a husband should treat one another, or somebody who's not married. And there are some important principles here. Sometimes people read a chapter like chapter 7 and find themselves a little confused or maybe upset or bothered. And we understand from modern day revelation, we understand the law of morality, the law of chastity. And we can read through the restoration perspective, Paul's principles and not find ourselves disturbed if the specific advice he gave to his people at his time 2,000 years ago, who were dealing, dealing with some pretty difficult situations, maybe not every piece of advice needs to be brought into our own hearts. But the principles, yes. Now, remember, we mentioned that Paul not only wrote a letter to the Corinthians before this one, but he also received a letter back from them. And look at verse 1 of chapter 7. Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Many have interpreted that to say, oh, so you wrote a letter to me, and now I'm giving you counsel. It is good for a man not to touch a woman. Look at the Joseph Smith translation. It's really helpful. They wrote in their letter saying it is good. They're the ones who wrote that in their letter, and then he's giving them um, some of these, these instructions here. Uh, I love the fact that, as Taylor was talking here, that that's the beauty of prophets and ongoing revelation and open canon where the Lord can continue to give instructions, reminding ourselves that Paul is not intending to give them meat. He's not intending to give them the end of the law here. He's just dealing with 
with struggles that they happen to be facing and that came up in a letter. Uh, the way uh, Elder Bruce R. McConkie spoke of chapter 7 is, this would be similar to how a mission president might address in certain parts of this chapter missionaries who are called to go out and, and minister to the work, but not to the general body of the saints. That's one potential way you could look at some of these teachings here in chapter 7. And as a warning to not read things out of context or just a proof text, there are people over the years who've read just this one verse and said, that must mean total celibacy and no more families, no more children. And it's like, okay, if that's the only verse you had of all scripture, that would be a fair conclusion if you didn't look at anything else. But we know there's more than that. And that's why it's always important to contextualize and remember as much as we want to draw true principles from the scriptures, we also have to curate our reading through the lens of the restoration and modern day prophets and what they are emphasizing. Then he, he gives a little insight here into certain types of relationships. And keep in mind, in the first century in Corinth, there would have been probably quite a few who fit this description in verse uh, 12, 13, and 14. He says, but to the rest speak I, not the Lord. Did you catch that? To the rest of the people, not the ones that he's addressed previous to verse 12, speak I, not the Lord. He's saying, look, I'm not speaking with any, any major authority here. I'm, I'm just talking to you now. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And he says the same thing in verse 13. If, if a woman has a husband that doesn't believe, don't put him away. Why? Why would you stay in those kinds of relationships? And he gives the answer, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. We can use this thing again about this continuum of body and spirit. So imagine you have one spouse on one side, one on the other. One is believing, one is not. You would think that commingling, that unity, would cause a degradation of the, the body of the two people. But really what Paul, what Paul is saying the opposite is actually the holiness or the person who's living in Christ will actually positively infect the other body, meaning that the unified whole will leaven itself into a holiness. And this is a really beautiful principle that we can interact with people who may not believe as we do and our love that we receive from God can uplift them and us together. Now, obviously, if there are people who are a bad influence in your life who just flat out are going to take you away from God's love, then we have to be thoughtful about that. But Paul's not talking about this. It seems like we have two people who are in a loving relationship. One happens to be Christian. One is still pagan. And Paul's saying, let that person who's a believer in Christ positively influence the life of those who are not yet Christian. And if they're keeping their Christian covenants, they will be loving the Lord God and their neighbor as themselves, and their closest neighbor will be their spouse. Mm -hmm. That love will, will be felt over time, and it's the most likely motivator for change. Not fear, not threats, not uh, promises of, of rewards, just love. Just loving somebody as purely as we possibly can is the greatest motivator. Let's be careful not to overstress Paul's teachings on family relationships in chapter 7 because he keeps signaling to us, look, I, I'm just kind of giving you my thoughts here. I'm not speaking for the Lord on a lot of this. I'm giving you proverbs or words to the wise, things to consider in, in this realm. So as we conclude this lesson today, let's go back to chapter 6 verse 19 and 20, this idea that our body individually, and back to chapter 3, collectively all of us being the temple where the Spirit of God can come and dwell among us and now in us, in verse 19, this idea, we are not our own, for we were bought with a price. Therefore, what do we do? glorify God in our body and in our spirit, which are God's. What a beautiful place to end this, uh, this message from Paul to those first century Corinthians that many of those lessons 
are just as applicable to us in our information age of the 21st century as they were in the Peloponnese of Greece 2,000 years ago. Know that God lives. He sent his Son to save us, and he sends the Holy Ghost to dwell among us and in us if we'll let him. And we leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Know that you're loved. And spread light and goodness.